The Black Plague was one of the deadliest diseases ever spread in human history, killing one third of Europe in the 1300s. During that time, people had limited knowledge about how pathogens spread and medical remedies leading to this large number of deaths. But you already knew that. There's plenty of games that take place in or are based on the Middle Ages, but very few are based on the Black Plague. What if there was a story-driven game full of lovable characters, an interesting plot, rewarding and fun gameplay, awesome visuals, and some of the best game music ever based on this lethality? Well, you've no need to wonder. A solo Studios has a series known as A Plague Tale that's precisely that. Players take control of the daughter of a French noble family in the 14th century as she protects her younger brother and others from bloodthirsty vermin and authoritative enemies. Of course, there's a lot more to this series than just this very small description, so without further ado, let's get into why a play tale is the best thing ever. In order to explain a play tale's gameplay, I think it's very important we get the story out of the way. By doing this, it makes it easier to understand the overall blueprints of the game and create a digestible discourse for all of its aspects. The first game called A Play Tale Innocence starts with Robert Derune and his daughter Amicia Derune, who we play as for most of the series, bonding as they walk through a forest. After Robert teaches her how to use a sling, things take a dark turn as their dog Leon runs into a rat's nest and gets eaten away by the rodents. They come back home and Robert tells Amicia to check on her mother and tell her he wants her. Beatrice, her mother, tells Amicia to look after her brother Hugo as she leaves for her husband. As Amicia meets her brother, they witness as the Spanish Inquisition breaks in, kills their father, and raids their home. You see, Hugo is diseased. He has a curse known as the Macula, and Beatrice was working on a cure to help her son. The Inquisition knows this, and tracked down the family order to study Hugo's blood for their own purposes, which we'll get into later. Anyways, the children escape the house, run into their mother, and while Hugo and Amicia make it out alive, their mother sacrifices herself so they could live. Before Beatrice died, she mentioned they had to go to someone named Laurentius for help with Hugo's condition. The two do make it to Laurentius' farm and meet Lucas, the alchemist's apprentice, but Hugo and Amicia had to deal with angry villagers, the Inquisition's guards, and of course, the rats. Trust me, this will not be the last time that happens. Speaking of the vermin, they devour the alchemist, and the three use the boat to get out of there. After some traveling, they run into two thieves, along with a bunch of guards, and the day runes get captured. Amicia wakes up in a Spanish fort, and the two get rescued by the two thieves, Arthur and Melly, and escape and regroup with Lucas. Afterwards, they find an abandoned castle where they can settle down and keep the rats away. However, Hugo's condition is only getting worse, so Amicia has to leave for a university, which holds a book Lucas can use to treat the macula. Amicia gets the book and returns home, and even brought a guest, Roderick who built the wall with his father that blocked the entrance to the book. This still isn't enough to help Hugo though, so Amicia and Lucas go back to the De Ruins residence so they can use Beatrice's lair to make a treatment. After that adventure, they make a potion, and while it does help Hugo, the little boy decides to run to the Inquisition because it was revealed in a previous chapter his mother is still alive and he wants to see her. Hugo gets captured by the Inquisition, but finds his mom, and because he drank the potion, can now control rats. The Inquisition takes advantage of this and creates our hero's castle in order to take down Amicia using Hugo. But when his sister decides to embrace him, he decides to drop the resentment he had for Amicia because he remembers what she means to him. In the battle though, Arthur got killed, so the group decides to take the Inquisition head on now that they have the rats on their side. To make it to the Grand Inquisitor, who's able to control his own army of rats. But no matter, Amicia cracks his cranium, saves their mother, and lives happily ever after. Just kidding, there's more. In Requiem, Amicia and Hugo are once again wanted. Why? Well, they ran into a group of beekeepers, and after they hurt Amicia, Hugo decided to stick the rats on them. After that fiasco, the family and Lucas settle down in a nice house, but Amicia and Lucas have to go on another adventure to find Magister Voden, who comes from an order that has dealt with the Macula for a long time, but he only hurts and belittles the wee lad. If that's not enough, Amicia and Lucas piss off the lord of the land they're on, along with a very powerful commander, nicknamed the Wall. Valden proclaims Hugo needs to be condemned, so they had to move to Marseille, but since Hugo is feeling so depressed and angered, the rats are becoming more and more bloodthirsty, to the point they destroy the town they were living in. After dealing with some complications on the boat, the Wall's army spots them and gives them hell. The siblings are able to defend themselves with Amicia's fierceness and Hugo's rats, but they get separated from Beatrice and Lucas. However, this is for the better. Or, so it seemed at the time. You see, Hugo has this reoccurring dream where he's healed by a lake on an island, and he believes that's where he'll be cured. 
This is further backed up by a drawing of Odin had that depicted a similar on to one in Hugo's dream. The Sylvans continued to try and find their way whilst being chased by soldiers. In all that chaos, Noal, also known by his real name, Arno, captures the two, but is now working with them instead. He'll show them the honor because he made a deal with Hugo. The three find a thief named Sophia, and since she owes Arno one, she uses her ship to take them to Lacuna, the island of Hugo's dream. They look for the lake, but Arno's plan is supposed to take place. In exchange for bringing them to Lacuna, Hugo promised to kill the Count of the Slam with his rats. Omisin will not allow for this to happen, but Arno figures it doesn't matter, he'll just kill the Count. Surprise, surprise, the siblings are back on the run, and once they do come in contact with the Count, his wife says it doesn't matter anymore, and invites them to their home. They get treated like royalty, and after a good night's sleep, Sophia meets up with the two, and after exploring the island, they find a temple in which the Count and Countess worship the child god of their island. In this area, they find out more about the macula, including the previous person that had it, and the person that protected them. They find something that leads to a castle that can give them more information about the macula, so they go there, but once they find what they were looking for, they get attacked, and Hugo unleashes his rats on the guards. Now, the island is in despair and ruin, as the vermin viciously terrorizes the town. There is one more spot the crew wants to investigate, which turns out to be the place the last care of the Macula was imprisoned. And this really gets to Hugo, but their visit is cut short as all the rats fill up the prison. Once they get out of there, they decide to leave, but are told Lucas and Beatrice were able to find Lacuna, so they go and meet them. The reunion is cut short though, as the Count pulls Amicia aside and tries to kill her. The Count believes Hugo to be the one prophesizing their beliefs. He is the child god, and they can't have Amicia by his side. Amicia is battered and bruised by the Count. Beatrice is killed, but they are able to escape and even save Arno. Their victory is cut short as they are attacked by the Count's ship, and Amicia gets knocked out by them. Arno carries Amicia to shore, and the Count followed them there. Arno sacrifices himself so the Count could be killed, but with him out of the way, the remaining crew go find Hugo and Marcy. Hugo is in the heart of the city, and even created a nebula of plague around Marcy, but Amicia is able to find her brother. After a depressing talk between the two, Hugo comes to the conclusion he has to die. If he lives, he will continue to bring destruction and chaos among the innocent. Amicia has a hard time accepting this, but after she sees the truth, she ends her brother's misery. Oh, sorry. I don't know how that got mixed in there. Afterwards, Requiem tries to cheer the player up a little bit with the last chapter, where Amicia explains to Sophia she's going to find where the macula is found, and will help the carrier and protect her. Cue the post credit scene. In my opinion, this is one of the best video game stories ever. It rivals some of the best fictional stories out there, and the ending to Requiem is the most emotional I've ever felt playing a video game. I think part of the reason for that is I grew up with three older brothers that really care for me, so family's always been a big aspect of my life. But I think the other big reasons is it's just so beautifully written. Having Hugo die was a big shock to me, and I'm sure it was surprising to everybody else that played Requiem. After all, Innocence had a good ending, and after everything else the two have been through, I thought Amicia was going to convince her brother that he can be saved as they've cheated death over and over again. But perhaps some things just can't be done. Requiem's message isn't give up on your dreams and ambitions because the hand life gives us makes them impossible. Rather, it tries to make players understand that some things in our lives simply can't be achieved, no matter our ambitions. But that's okay, because there's so much more things in this life that could be done to make life worth it, despite all of our trials and tribulations. It's the reason Requiem has a chapter after Hugo dies. Is to emphasize the way we can adapt around change and set our sights onto new things that serve our purpose here on earth that can actually be done. It's not easy to walk away from something that we love so much, but it's okay to walk away from it because there's so much more that we can care for and love for. Amicia is one of the emotionally strongest characters in video game history. Despite everything she goes through, she stays strong, never gives into anything, and fights for what she believes in. She's smart, caring, and righteous but she can still fall, as demonstrated by the couple of times she's gotten overwhelmed by her enemies and captured, or in Requiem's case, gotten close to death. Making Amicia a teenager makes so much sense in the general theme of innocence and growing up. Amicia isn't a young child anymore, and she's at an age where she starts to learn how the real world works. She's the bridge between Hugo and the rest of the adult characters in the game in more ways than just age. She doesn't have a childlike naiveness anymore, but she also has so much more to learn. Amicia also has a good heart, she wants Hugo to get better because she loves him so much, but 
but I think part of the reason is she wants the plague to end, or at least slow down. The horror she saw during both games, including dead bodies, quarantine houses, and people's attitudes, surely made an impact on her mind and heart. After all, she was raised right. It's implied by Sir Nicholas and other guards passing dialogue that Robert de Roon was a great knight of honor, and when the Inquisition questions the de Roon servants, they don't give up any information and die for them. They were treated with respect by the family. Otherwise, why wouldn't they just give up everything they knew about them if the de Roons couldn't care less about their well-being? One of their servants even died for Beatrice, and Amicia knew the name of the person that sacrificed themselves. They truly do care for others. The game surely knows how to make players feel bad for Hugo too. He's just a kid. He doesn't know how to control his emotions. Like the rest of us, he just wants to live his life and find some kind of peace. The troubles this boy goes through at just 5 years old is so heavy and deep, it's surprising Hugo didn't completely crack in innocence. If most people knew the death of many innocent people was caused by them, they wouldn't be able to live with themselves. Now apply that to a young lad that doesn't know anything about the world and has to deal with so much other stuff on top of that. The connection the two form throughout the game is so satisfying and wholesome. Over time, they really start to bond and care for one another. As I mentioned before, I have three older brothers, so I can't confirm. The bond between Hugo and Amicia is pretty accurate to how siblings are. That is, if you have a healthy relationship with them. They get on our nerves, sure. That comes with the territory of being a sibling. But they care about us, and genuinely want us to live our lives to the fullest. It brings no joy to them to see us suffer. They start to tease each other. Amicia treats her brother like royalty in the way she calls him a king, and does everything to protect him. And Hugo does everything he can to protect his sister. Even when they're not on the best of terms, they still remember what they mean to each other, and are grateful for being family. It's the reason Hugo forgives Amicia so quickly for lying about their mother when he returns to the castle in innocence, and why he gives his sister a big hug when she finds a way back to him in Sophia and Bastilis' prison, even though he was afraid to be down there. Or if we're talking about Amicia's perspective, it's the reason she constantly goes out of her way to get what Hugo needs, no matter how dangerous it is. They love each other so much, and their bond is so special. The final chapter of Innocence really encapsulates the bond they created throughout the game. They won't always get what they want in life, but as long as they have each other, that's all they need. Such a heartwarming scene, it's the complete opposite of Requiem's ending. One celebrates the journey of life, while the other one describes the horrors of having to see a loved one die. On to the rest of the characters, Millie and Arthur serve as a small foil between the siblings. Obviously, since they're older and thieves, their innocence has mostly faded, but that doesn't mean they can't care for others or have a good moral compass. If neither of them cared, they wouldn't have kept helping our characters, even when they had nothing to gain from it, other than a sense of companionship and protecting each other. They serve as a way to remind the De Ruin siblings that one day, they won't be as pure or as naive as they once were, but that doesn't mean they had to lose all their morals and forget what they once believed in. They can always stick together through thick and thin, unless the thick and thin is a deadly curse that will always make its way through history. Lucas and Sophia are awesome companions. They keep our duo sane throughout the game by being resourceful, but more importantly, they remind the De Ruins they are human, and it's okay to feel the way they do. They're great moral support, as they often push those two to keep going, and not to give up, because they have it in them to make things better and accomplish their mission. After all, Amicia and Hugo would do the same for the rest of their friends, so Lucas and Sophia are just repeating their sentiment back to them. The dynamic between Arno and Amicia progresses in a way that makes sense. Obviously, he's pissed at her because she keeps killing her men, once they talk to each other and learn a little bit about each other, you see they actually have a decent amount in common. They start to understand why they do the things they do, and how the war and the bite affected their lives. Part of the reason why Amicia saves Arno is because of Hugo, but she also decides to forgive him because, despite all the bad he's done, Arno isn't necessarily a bad man. Sure, he's killed a lot of people and manipulated Hugo, but Amicia also has a list of sins, so who is she to judge him? And who can forget some lovable comedy to break the tension? That's where Roger comes in. Even if he's only in innocence for a short time, he certainly made a great impression and left a mark on the player's mind due to his comedic and barbaric nature that's so lovable due to how carefree and laid-back he is, even if he does have his moments. That's not to mention some of the symbolism found throughout the games. The flowers Hugo can pick in Innocent represent Hugo's, well, innocence and purity. It shows he's still a child having to learn the ways of life and doesn't understand the evil that roams the earth. It also represents Amicia's innocence. Before the events of the game, she was just a girl living her life, but she was suddenly thrown into a conundrum. That's why Hugo places the herbs in her hair. Hugo's purity reminds Amicia of who she is, and why she's on this journey. It's to protect her brother, and lessen the evil in the world. The background of the flowers also relates to the part of the story they're found in, like how the Columbines in Chapter 4 represents the loss the two have experienced, and will continue to experience. The Phoenix represents Hugo as a whole. 
Like how a phoenix grows from the remains of its predecessor, Hugo is able to control the rats because of the macula transfer from Bastilius. And the macula will continue to appear throughout history, just like how the mythical bird always comes back. Both are also capable of great damage. Funny enough though, phoenixes are often associated with light and fire, which is symbolized heavily considering how much Requiem emphasizes and shows off fire, but it could be reflective of Hugo's innocence, but also serves as a juxtaposition to what the rats fear. The foreshadowing, like how a lady in the Mark mentions to Amicia, a lady's hair is her righteous crown, which foreshadows how Amicia's hair is altered throughout the game, and as she loses more of it, she loses her sanity, control, and morality. And some general parallels, like how the Countess tells Amicia not to let her torch die in the sanctuary, then Amicia tells the same thing to Sophia in a later chapter. Before we move on to the gameplay, I just want to mention how cool it is that Innocence has some of the story for Requiem already set up. So if players are to play the first game after they've already played Requiem, they'll notice a lot of connections between the two games that would have gone unnoticed in their first playthrough. They'll notice certain things like the Order symbol placed around multiple locations, and the Phoenix and Beatrice's laboratory. Along with the motherly image that gets brought up again with the way the Countess talks about the Child of Embers. Well, with the story out of the way, let's get to the actual gameplay. In both games, players are going to have to be stealthy, as there's only so much two youngins can do against an army of soldiers, but they'll also have to deal with the bloodthirsty fighters. Players are going to have to take things slow in many sections as they sneak by guards, and try to distract them by throwing rocks at certain objects to get the soldiers attention. As for the rats, they hate light, so keep the duo in your fires to keep the plague at bay. Amicia's main weapon of choice is the sling, where she can shoot rocks to crack craniums, but she can also use it to fling certain objects. Now, while the sling is used pretty much the same way in both games, the way materials are used is different. Let's start with the similarities. Amicia can throw Ignifer to light up flammable objects to combat the bloodthirsty vermin, Extinguisher to put out those fires, and Episanguish to attract the rats to a surface for a short period of time. The player also has the option to kill the rats in a small radius with Luminosa and Innocence, and with a pot mixed with Ignifer and Requiem. The problem with using this method in the first game is it uses a lot of resources, so it should be used sparingly in Innocence, although the same thing could be said for the second game, as pots are not necessarily plentiful in Requiem, so players should think before throwing. In both games, players will, a lot of the time, have a companion alongside Amicia and Hugo, and most of them have a special ability the player can use to get past sections. Millie can lockpick doors and chests, Roderick beats down guards and breaks open doors, Lucas has a fire trick to blind enemies, Arno takes on soldiers, and Sophia can burn grass as a distraction and use that same present to create a light circle to fend off the rats. Hugo can control the rats in both games too, but of course, the way it's done is different. In Innocence, Hugo doesn't control the rats until chapter 14, can only control the vermin that are directly in front of him, and Amicia can never get hurt by the rats with this ability. In Requiem, whenever Hugo is present, he can control a crowd of rats from a distance, but even with them in his control, they can still kill Amicia. Hugo also can't use the rats for too long, or else he'll get overwhelmed and lose the ability for a short period of time. This difference makes sense. Innocence only had so many rats, and Hugo had more control of his emotions in that story. And since his feelings are directly connected to the plague, he could make it so none of them eat the people he cared about. Obviously, since Hugo often felt sad and hopeless in the second game, his ability is nerfed, as the creature spawn in huge waves out of nowhere, and his mind isn't in a good state. In this sense, his exclusive items are Devorantis, which removes soldiers' helmets, and Somnum, which allows for Amicia to put soldiers to sleep instantly, so it's essentially a Hollywood's version of chloroform. Devorantis is fun, but a risky item to have in the game. Sure, it allows for Amicia to end a soldier's life, but it can also cause other enemies in the region to notice their allies' outbursts and see Amicia. Somnum really isn't worth it. There are so many ways to distract and kill guards that it's pretty useless. I never used it to pass the time the game forced me to use it. Requiem's exclusive items are a crossbow, which can be used to kill enemies and can be mixed with other materials, tar, and a skill tree. The crossbow is pretty self-explanatory, aim and shoot, and can also be used to fend off the rats and pull down certain set pieces. Tar allows for fires to burn brighter, so the crew can make the rats scurry out of their way. For the skill tree, Prudence refers to the stealth aspect of the game, and if upgraded, allows Amicia to sneak around enemies more effectively and silently. Aggressive refers to how Amicia fights off the soldiers throughout the game as she learns combat skills. In opportunities is sort of a middle ground between the two. Players earn these skills based on the amount of soldiers they kill during each encounter with them. Obviously killing a lot of enemies gives the player an increase in the aggressive stat, and only killing when necessary gives the player more prudence progression. This skill tree is a nice addition to Requiem. It gives players more skills to utilize when creeping about, more ways to get out of a sticky situation, it also gives players the choice to strengthen the way they want to play the game. They're not just small upgrades either. Some of them are really useful like increased stun capability with the sling, and moving faster while crouched. 
This skill tree along with the regular upgrades of the game go hand in hand. This game really knew how to give players a lot of options when it came to moving to the next section. Speaking of the general upgrades, let's talk about those next. Amicia can make her equipment better with the materials she picks up throughout the game. Multiple types of materials will need to be used in order to craft upgrades in Innocence, but Requiem only needs the player to use an object called Pieces in order to get better equipment. Every piece of equipment has 3 upgrades, and, naturally, they require more parts as they progress. Players are really going to have to look for the more rare materials if they want Amicia to have the best arsenal possible. Just like the skill tree, these upgrades are meaningful, quite helpful, and generally fun to use. I just love being able to shoot 2 rocks in a sling without having to reload. Juggling soldiers with the sling is so satisfying. Both games have collectibles players can pick up or examine throughout the adventures. The first game has flowers that Amicia puts in her hair, which was replaced with feathers Amicia puts on Hugo's clothing and Requiem, although there are two flowers that can be picked in the game, along with the protector pack that allows for Amicia to wear all the flowers from Innocence. In my opinion, the flowers are cooler because they're the ones that can really be seen during gameplay. Sure, the players can see the feathers on Hugo's shirt if they look, but considering the two face away from the game's camera most of the time, they can really only naturally be seen during cutscenes. The flowers don't have this issue, since it's on the side of Amicia's hair, it can regularly be seen during gameplay and cutscenes. Anyways, in Innocence, players can find gifts, which Amicia will collect in order to get to her friends and family, or should I say it's implied, there's no cutscenes where she actually does it. And Curiosities, which are items that pertain to the time period the game takes place in, to enrich the game's setting, and give players some interesting facts about the past. Requiem replaces both these with souvenirs which are these small events where Amicia and company will interact with an object or another person and it adds onto the story or the bond the characters have between themselves. Small things like these really add on to the overall quality of these games. You know what they say, it's the small things in life. So finding these little trinkets could be satisfying, expand the player's knowledge like how the curiosities give some historical background, or give more depth to the characters like how the souvenirs do. The souvenirs can also be wholesome, heart-lifting moments that give the players a look at what life's all about. I will say, while some of the slower parts of a plague tale are just fine and dandy, as they can serve as a nice breather from all the chaos and make way to deliver the story at a steady pace, some of them are also really boring. This is more of a Requiem problem, and this since its pace was quite good, and you want to break things up with the actual gameplay and not try to harp too much on telling the story. The second game told a good story for sure, and had engaging fun chapters, but the way it was interlaced in the gameplay wasn't the greatest. There are large sections where there are small amounts of action, as I stated before, slow moments are fine to get the story and gameplay some breathing room, but they go on for too long and really only serve as a way to deliver the story rather than provide some sort of stimulation. This is especially true with some of Requiem's later chapters, as some have unnecessarily long walking sections and don't really have too much exciting gameplay. It's fine for first time players that are there for the story, because it's easier to ignore these things when they're so absorbed in how everything is played out, but coming back to this game could be a drag because of how drawn out some of the slower parts feel. And since returning players already know what's going to happen, the amount of attention isn't what it once was. I get that, with story driven games, not every moment is going to be intense and action packed. The story has to be involved, but it feels like the balance between gameplay and cutscenes is off for Requiem. Otherwise, the gameplay for a Plague Tale is quite fun. Whether the player chooses to keep things stealthy or to fight every enemy in sight, both styles can be rewarding and adrenaline pumping, and it's nice the game gives players a choice. The upgrades in both games keeps players from mindlessly using materials and gives meaningful advantages. The skill tree in Requiem was a great idea because it gives players more freedom for their playstyle due to the new choices they can make with the abilities they acquire. And the collectibles are small ways the game spices things up, adds to the immersion, and keeps players looking for ways to get off the beaten path. The A Plague Tale games look absolutely beautiful due to the way they immerse the player in the 14th century with its Middle Ages aesthetic, which includes an emphasis on nature and ancient technologies. The lighting in this game is also integral to the game's visuals. After all, it's set before electricity was discovered, so there's no artificial lighting. Everything that's lit up comes from the sun or a source of fire. That's not to mention the amazing architecture in the games, like the intricate designs of the religious buildings, the ruggedness of the rundown villages, and the complexity of the castles. Just look at these cool illustrations in the monk's temple, they're just so neat to look at. It's such a joy to walk through the town in Requiem's second chapter, due to the way it shows off the variety of what it offers, along with just how beautiful everything looks. And that's just two of the examples of the lively visuals. There's plenty to be seen throughout both games. Everything from top to bottom was given attention and carefully crafted. No stone was left unturned. 
The game also accommodates for changes in scenery too. Like, whenever it rains, players can see how the characters' clothes will get soaked. Or whenever the group takes a big fall, there's dirt over their faces and bodies. The character models look really good. They're quite realistic, and they very much look like humans. This is especially true with Requiem. So many scenes in that game look lifelike, almost as if the game was filmed in real life. Their clothing is also quite detailed. If the player were to zoom in on some of the characters' apparel, they'll notice all the small materials the clothes are made out of, and other minute or major imperfections, whether it's the small strings of yarn on the day runes, or the rust and wear found on the soldiers. Their animations are quite fluid too. The way Amicia flicks her sling is so smooth, and shows she really knows how to use that sucker. Speaking of animations, I had to bring this up, but to showcase the bond Amicia and Hugo made in Innocence, Hugo will often help her sister with smaller things whenever they're together in Requiem. For example, whenever Amicia helped Hugo up a ledge in Innocence, he would just stand there as his sister climbed up, but in Requiem, Hugo will help her get up a ledge. The same can be seen with opening chests. In Innocence, Hugo just stands there, but in Requiem, he will also open up the chest. Small details like that really add on to everything. Anyways, using the game's photo mode is such a treat because of the visuals. The game gives the player a lot of options for taking a fancy screenshot, including the ability to use photo mode during cutscenes and allowing the player to go way beyond what they should be able to see. With all the pleasantries of the visuals, it's time to talk about some of the more darker and gritty aspects of the graphics. First, the rats. They look just as disgusting as disease-ridden ruins can look. They have slimy, glossy bodies and their eyes glow. The way they move about is also unsettling. Speaking of the vermin, Innocents can load up to 5,000 rat models at once, and because of this, the game does an adequate job at showing how plentiful the rats are and how they're all around France. If you thought that was a lot of rats, well, let Requiem blow your mind, as that game can load up to 300,000 rat models at once, and my god, does the Sobo love showing that off in the sequel. There are plenty of rat ridden areas in Requiem that'll absolutely blow your mind due to how many rats are just scurrying around or actively destroying things. It's quite impressive the game is able to handle that amount of models at once, and still run at a stable frame rate, without sacrificing image quality. Granted, these rat models are quite low poly, but since they're not really supposed to be seen up close, it doesn't really matter how many polygons they have, they do their job quite well. Some other disgusting visuals include the remains of the soldiers that have been eaten away, the slaughter of animals outside of Laurentius' farm, and the rats have this diabolical material they have in their nest that's not pleasant at all to look at, let alone sludge through. To fit in with the Middle Ages theme, a playtale uses a lot of instruments commonly associated with those times, including lutes, violins, cellos, and hurdy-gurdies just to name a few. Just like the visuals, a playtale soundtrack is absolutely beautiful. There's no other way to put it. It's astonishing how Olivier Doivier was able to take all these instruments and make so much strong emotion that works so well with the story happening on screen and immerse them in the world of the 14th century. Innocence really conveys the emotions of happiness, sadness, and dread. One moment, the music is all cherry, makes the player happy to live, then it does a complete 180 in order to scare the player, and tell them they're in deep trouble if they don't do something. If we're talking Requiem though, holy actual hell. Did Doivier absolutely knock it out of the park with creating an emotional soundtrack for a video game? The sharp squeal that plays many times in the earlier chapters really gets me every time I hear it. That damn soundbite is such a cacophony. Easily two of the best video game soundtracks of all time. And I would definitely recommend watching the creator talking about how he made Innocence's music. Real informative and interesting stuff. Well enough of the soundtrack, let's talk about the voice acting. It's pretty good too. The voice actors fit their characters quite well, and give damn good performances. And just like the music, Requiem took the game's already good voice acting and took it to the next level. Charlotte McBurney really gave it her all in voicing Amicia in the sequel. And part of that is, Asobo shaped Amicia around the voice actor for the second game, due to the fact she did so well for Innocence. It's more than just the way she delivers the lines. Part of the reason why dying from the rats in this game is so unsettling is how realistic her screams sound as Amicia is being eaten away. That's not to take away from the other voice actors. They're pretty good too, but Charlotte is in a league of her own. While still in the voice acting, whatever Amicia is on the prowl, the guards, along with other NPCs, will often talk to each other, and it's more than just regular banter. There's dialogue that enriches the lore, such as when they talk about the reputation behind certain characters like Robert de Rune and Sir Nicholas, how the bite is affecting morale in the population, and other pieces of their now stressful life. Just neat ways to enhance the lore, and give insight to how the average population feels about the plague situation. Speaking of adding on to the situation, 
The character's tone will sometimes change depending on which part of the game they're in. Climb up. All right. Get up now. Understood. All right, on to the sound effects. I'll say it again, but they're pretty good. Once more, they really immerse the player into the world of Plague Tale. The flick of Amicia's sling is oh so satisfying. The ding from rock hitting metal is so sharp. The fire sound effects are quite realistic, and the hiss of the rats is disgusting and creepy. If I was to criticize the sound department for this game, I had to bring up that sometimes dialogue gets overlaid, as in two characters will be talking to each other, then another will butt in. It's hard to pay attention to what is being said because the player found something or went a little too fast during a section. Otherwise, the sound department is really, really good, with its unforgettable soundtrack, realistic voice acting, and impactful sound effects. And that's a Plague Tale. It's easy to see why it still loves with its fun, sometimes slow, but rewarding gameplay, an emotional roller coaster of a story filled with very lovable characters, an interesting take on the Black Plague, that damn ending to Requiem, jaw dropping graphics, a well put together soundtrack that fits in with the time period of the games, appropriately expressive voice acting, and so much more. This series means so much to me. A day doesn't go by where I'm not grateful for giving this franchise a try and leaving a mark on my brain and my heart. If only I knew what I was getting into when I bought Innocence for 15 bucks during the Winter Steam Sale 2022. A play tale is so powerful that many people have come out to talk about how it's moved them and the emotional impact it's had on their lives. People on the game subreddit have expressed feeling empty and utterly depressed after completing Requiem. Heck, scenes that aren't nearly as bad as Hugo's death still get to people, like these posts from people on that same subreddit expressing their discomfort for the scene where the pig in chapter 4 is eaten, and feeling so sad for Hugo being used by the Grand Inquisitor. Crazy the amount of influence such a powerful piece of fiction can have on us. So, what's the future for a play tale look like? Well, there is a TV series on the way that's going to be an entirely French production, and the director is in close toss with the Sobo, so I have a good feeling about it. It's still far away, but Brilliance takes time. I'll gladly wait for a good adaptation of a play tale, even if it takes a couple years. Asobo and his publisher, Focus Entertainment, are cooperating to make another game. Whether it be another entry to the series is unknown, but I have a lot of faith Asobo will knock it out of the park again with a new franchise if they decide to go that route. There isn't a play tale book that still hasn't been translated into English, or any other language for that matter. Although it seems Asobo isn't going to translate it, but maybe, just maybe, one day, they'll change their minds or a really good unofficial English translation will come out. Otherwise, that's all I have to say for this beautiful piece of work. Have a good day and remember what we live for.